we're now going to start with an overview of childhood trauma and the life course. This is an, an area in which there's been enormous work uh, in multiple disciplines over the course of the last decade or so. I can tell you from my standpoint as director of the DART Center that I, I've seen the scientific understanding of the impact of early childhood violence and early childhood adversity revolutionized. One of those revolutionaries uh, is Nadine Burke Harris, MD, MPH, FAAP, who's here with us. Um, to introduce her, though, uh, I'm honored to introduce my friend and colleague, Jane West, who started life as in, in our tribe as a journalist and worked in this field for many years before um, changing hats and moving into psychology and then changing hats again and moving, at least with part of her brain, into philanthropy and being a keen supporter of reform in early childhood uh, development. Um, she's one of our funders, but she also is an insightful part of the conversation. Um, she is going to introduce Dr. Uh, Nadine Burke Harris and is going to lead the conversation with you, so I will get out of the way. You know you're very important when you have two introductions, which you are. So can you guys hear me every which way in the back, up there? So yes, I am a fellow journalist. I do still consider myself a journalist. I can tell you more about that another time. I'm also a graduate of this building, so it's really fun to be in this room where I had uh, what used to be the fastest masters in the country. I think they've made it longer now, but um, had some seminal moments in this room. So I wanted to add my welcome. Uh, I, I did a lot of work in documentary film, worked with Frontline and Nova, and over at the BBC, and I was very happy doing what I considered carpet bagging, which is showing up when other people had spent many years fundraising a big documentary project. And I guess I could have continued to do that, but I came across, to me, what feels like the story of my life, which was early childhood development. I realized I loved beginnings and that these beginnings, our beginnings, really matter a lot. And then I started to understand what was going on in the field and the term intervention being an unbelievably powerful act. And there's a graph that I'll never forget that shows uh, development starting from coming out. And that just a little bit of delay and over time you really get off that line. But if you intervene early you get right back on if you have the right interventions. And so putting kids back on developmental trajectories is what I care absolutely the most about or preventing them from getting off to begin with. And this field has come a long way. And this week you're gonna be lucky to hear from just giants in the field. And the first is right here, right now, what I consider, who I consider a trailblazer. And believe me, we use the word trailblazer because it has not been an easy path. You did not choose an easy course <laughs> as a doctor. Um, our speaker today, Nadine Burke Harris, is a pediatrician. And these are some adjectives and names I've added. A public health big thinker, a nonprofit leader of a movement to help children living with adversity everywhere through the use of systems of early detection and treatment. So those are ways I'd identify her, but I asked her permission earlier, and she's agreed, at least for the purposes of the next hour, <laughs> maybe longer, to also have the title of investigative reporter. Because when you read her book, you are gonna see how that is true. In her work, she uses many tools of the trade. First off, she knows how to recognize a story when she sees one using her gut, her life experience, her curious and scientific mind, and her wide sense of social purpose. So she knows how to recognize the story, and then she knew how to go after that story with detective work and tenacity. And as you read the book, you'll see how she persists. And then uh, maybe a newer term, at least for people like me, is she knows how to wade deeply into big data. And in her case, there were two 
big sets of data that she came across pretty quickly when she started her important job that led to all of this. Uh, one piece of the big data was an underappreciated, amazing study that was essentially sitting on a shelf. And thanks to Dr. Burke Harris, has seen much light of day. And then the other piece of big data were and are her patients in her clinic that were clearly in pain but not essentially diagnosed with what was going on. And in that mix, no clinical tools at that point to pick up what she was after. So recognized, went after the story, waded deeply into the data, and then what happened? She got the whole story. Now, some of us may have learned in school about nature versus nurture, and that there's one debate that's actually over, and it's nature and nurture. It's epigenetics, which you will hear more about. She gets that whole story. And then not only does she get it comprehensively, but she got inside of the story. And I, by that, I mean it literally, getting inside the minds, the bodies of what it's like to have early childhood adversity and why it persists. So then on top of that, as an investigative reporter, she has a book. She is sharing what she's learned and critical takeaways for the public. So a true trailblazer. And I think first and foremost, that's probably to her families as a practitioner, that she has made a huge impact in their lives. But I am standing before you because when I heard she was coming, I said, oh my gosh, she changed my life. And so Kate said, okay, well then you're doing the introduction. <laughs> and the reason for that is that the where I ended up working after being a journalist it was a very difficult time. It was the beginning days of early childhood mental health. And I was working in the mountains of Colorado trying to go into preschools and on home visits to bring about uh, talk around children's behavior and what traumas and what was going on. And the county commissioners in this county in Colorado said, early infant mental health? Are you putting little babies on couches? You know, what, what is this, this Freud at a young age? And there was very little support or understanding. And of course, in the West, there's also this ethic of pull up your own bootstraps, get going, why are you even looking for help and support? So when I learned about her work, which you will hear in a minute, really conceptualizes what's going on for kids as a public health crisis, not just mental health needs, which are uncomfortable for people to think about, but public health and educational crisis, that there were signs everywhere in the people before all of us and in classrooms, in medical centers. She put all the signs together, all the puzzle pieces. And so I see her as a true intellectual architect connecting the dots and creating a powerful new narrative and as well a new field. I have uh, many colleagues I could have asked about her work. I asked two, but it, it could have been many pages. One of them works in our main hospital, Children's Hospital in Denver, and I asked what the impact of, of Dr. Burkhardt Swartz has, has been, and she said that um, translating the work of the ACEs into everyday primary care practice made it incumbent on each and every one of us to address adversity in our work each and every day with each and every patient. So a, a translation and integration immediately. And then a professor of clinical psychology said that this idea of treating the well, which you'll see in the book, is breathtaking and that the one of the most compelling talks her graduate students ever heard was uh, the talk that was given by Dr. Burke Harris on the mechanisms that create toxic stress. And as a journalist, I'll tell you, she has the who, the what, the where, the whys, and the whens of it all. So as I said, when I heard she was coming, I wanted to expose myself to the stress of introducing her, to thank her for how her work has validated what's going on all of us in this field and how it's calmed and motivated me, and not just me, but many, many others. I trust and hope that you will find yourselves at the end of this with new lenses, whether you are a crime, health, neighborhood, education, politics, science, or solutions reporter.
Her work is likely to lead you to many stories for a long time to come. And as I recall from her book, they'll lead you from the mundane to the revelatory. Here we go. If you want. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Um, it's such a privilege to have the opportunity to speak um, with all of you. And I think uh, any, any public health crusader with the opportunity to get in front of a bunch of journalists just like jumps at the opportunity. Um, but I'd like to just uh, start off by, you know, before I even begin, let me ask this question. How many folks are familiar with uh, at the term adverse childhood experiences and the adverse childhood experiences study. Okay, so we have maybe uh, two thirds. And how many folks are familiar with, um, feel comfortable with uh, the term toxic stress and the concept of toxic stress? Okay. I, I, well, we'll by the end of it, hopefully everybody will feel comfortable. Um, but this is really a fascinating uh, experience for me, and it's been a fascinating experience for me, um, just because uh, 10 years ago when I started off this work, I, um, you know, I, I'd get in a room literally with a thousand people and ask how many people had heard of adverse childhood experiences or toxic stress, and three hands would go up, right? Um, let me see, what, what day is it today? Thursday? I think it was Monday? You all will tell me, because you all are journalists. I believe it was Monday that a federal judge uh, who issued the injunction against the Trump administration policy of separating uh, parents from their children at, at the border, on page 19, of his decision, he cited that, um, that this type of separation also dramatically increased the risk of toxic stress, which leads to uh, changes in brain architecture and increased risk of stress-related disease for the lifetime. And um, that was a pretty amazing moment for me on Monday night or Tuesday morning or whenever it is I read that um, because it really shows how far this work has come in terms of when we raise awareness about the science and the mechanisms of childhood adversity and how it truly affects health throughout the lifetime, um, how that information can be used in so many different ways, oftentimes in ways that we never anticipated. Um, so I'll start a little bit by just talking about how I came into this work, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, what the public still doesn't know about uh, adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress, and really the powerful role that you all play in uh, communicating and, and and really being on the front lines of changing and, sh and shaping the way we respond globally to this public health crisis. So what year was it? Uh, 2007, uh, I uh, opened uh, my clinic in Bayview Hunters Point, which was one of San Francisco's poorest and most underserved neighborhoods. And, uh, you know, you can read all about the story in the book. I won't go into super detail about it, but one of the things that was um, really fascinating about the experience was that here I was opening a clinic in an underserved neighborhood with the purpose of improving health outcomes and reducing health disparities. And because I had also done a master's degree in public health, one of the things that they teach you in public health school is how to no notice patterns, how to notice trends, right? So in medical school, they teach you how to uh, treat the individual patient. But in public health school, they, they teach you to step back and look at what happens. This is, this is uh, 
this is the p public health parable of the well, right? Which is that if if a hundred people drink from the same well and they all get really sick, right? Medical school will teach you how to write the prescription for that, you know, horrible illness that they've developed. But public health school teaches you to step back and ask the question, what the hell is in that well, right? And uh, so as a pediatrician, when I was being referred patient after patient after patient, most often for ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, right? And I would sit there and I would do their history and physical. And uh, the funny thing was that, that in the history part of the history and physical, I was noticing that my patients who had the worst outcomes were also the ones who seemed to have the most severe histories of adversity. And it wasn't just their behavioral outcomes, it was also their health, right? So in the book, I, I uh, tell the story of a girl whom I call Kayla. And uh, as I was sitting there, this is a girl who had terrible asthma. And I had been essentially throwing the kitchen sink at her. I had been, I had put her on several rounds of very powerful medications to try and keep her out of the hospital. And as I was sitting with her m mom again and asking, okay, is, it, is there anything that you notice? Like what could her asthma triggers be? Is it, you know, uh, pet dander or cockroaches or pollen or cleaning products? You know, what is it that we haven't done a good job of removing from her environment? And I'll never forget what her mom said to me. She said, you know, doctora, I noticed that my daughter's asthma tends to act up every time her dad punches a hole in the wall. And I would love to say that that was a unique story, but it wasn't. What I was seeing in my patients was that in addition to the things that you would expect, the behavioral problems and mental health problems and kids who were, uh, you know, in, in the population that I was serving, right? One third of the black boys had been arrested by age 17. One third. But there was also crazy rates of autoimmune disease, right? rashes and pneumonias and infections and asthma and diabetes. And as I began looking and piecing together all the pieces from my training and my, you know, my medical school training, my public health training, I began to ask myself, you know, I w is it possible? I wonder, right, if the stress and trauma that these kids are experiencing, it's not even I wonder if it's affecting their health. I was looking at them and I was like, okay, uh, you don't have to have an MD or an MPH to know it's affecting their health. But the better question was how is it affecting their health? And that was the important question to ask. So y'all are journalists, you know sometimes the key to breaking a story is asking the right question. So it really wasn't about the if, it was about the how. And when I read the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which was published by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente, and I saw the data, right? And it, it, in this study, what they did was they asked 17 and a half thousand adults about their histories of 10 categories of adverse childhood experiences. And these include physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, or growing up in a household where a parent was mentally ill, substance dependent, incar incarcerated, where there was parental separation or divorce or domestic violence, right? And for every yes, you'd get a point on your ACE score. And then they compared these ACE scores, these adverse childhood experiences scores, to health outcomes. And what they found was stunning. And the two main findings were one, that ACEs were incredibly common. So this is really interesting. If you look at, for example, sexual abuse, or if you look at physical abuse, or if you look at um, having a parent who is mentally ill, 
each of those, the prevalence is roughly somewhere between 10 and 25 percent, right? But what folks um, didn't recognize, oh wait, let me, not, let me not spoil it. Let me just say, each of those is between 10 and 25 percent. But if you put all of them together, two-thirds of the population has experienced at least one adverse childhood experience. And one in eight folks has experienced four or more. And what was powerful about this study is that it wasn't done in uh, a low-income neighborhood. It wasn't done in, uh, you know, a, a ghetto or, a, you know, anything like that. It was done in Kaiser San Diego. The population was 70% Caucasian, 70% college-educated, middle class, right? Private, they all had private health insurance. So this really defied the myth that these things only happen to certain people or in certain places, right? Or for what many people all over feel like, oh, maybe this only happened to me. The other piece um, uh, of the finding that was completely, again, groundbreaking, just myth shattering, was that there was a strong dose response relationship between adverse childhood experiences and not just the stuff that you would expect, right? Mental health disorders, behavioral disorders, you know, depression, suicidality, uh, uh, alcoholism, IV drug use, right? All those things that we kind of already knew, right? But also a strong dose response relationship, right? And when I say dose response relationship, I mean the higher the dose you've experienced, the, the greater your health risk with things like heart disease, right? Common chronic diseases, heart disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, no, um, Alzheimer's, right? Diabetes. And the piece of that that was really fascinating was that, again, myth. Oh, of course, this is because those people who've experienced those bad things because their parents didn't raise them, right? they're more likely to drink and smoke and do all the things that are going to ruin your health. So that's why. Uh, but it turns out, and this is where being absolutely in love with the topic that you're researching really helps. Because, you know, I was reading this stuff, I was reading these strong associations, and I was like, huh, if there truly is this biological link, then is there a way for us to assess how much of it is due to these health risk behaviors and how much of it is due directly to the biology? And so it turns out some really smart researchers actually did this analysis. They did logistic regression analysis to say, if you have lots of adverse childhood experiences, yes, you are more likely to drink and smoke and do stuff that's gonna ruin your health. But that only accounts for about 50% of the increased risk. So if you have seven or more adverse childhood experiences, your risk for ischemic heart disease is 360%. You're 3.6 times as likely to develop heart disease as a person with zero ACEs. And I just wanna say heart disease is the number one cause of mortality, right, of, er of early mortality in the world. So now what this does is it takes childhood adversity and it connects it to an outcome that is not only a really common health outcome, a really prevalent health outcome that every minister of health, every head of you know, a public health department, it's, it's part of their job to try and drive this down. But it's also something that is less likely to be considered a disease of mor moral failing, right? So unlike depression or alcoholism where people feel fine judging and stigmatizing those people because those are other people, that's not us, and the people who get that, th they're weak anyways, right? It's like, oh, well, if you get heart disease or if you get Alzheimer's, shoot, if you got four more ACEs, you're 11 times as likely to develop Alzheimer's? What moral failing is that due to? Right? So the, the piece of it for me um, that I really enjoyed about doing this work, it was um, getting really deep into the science 
and also really deep into understanding what are all of the obstacles to us really being able to respond to this at, um, in our communities, right? So uh, one is the myth and misinformation, two is the judgment, right? Three is this concept that, oh, okay, well, you know, I may believe you that this is a, a, a big problem, right? But we certainly don't have the money to try and solve this problem because, you know, it's lack of resources. Well, here's what's exciting. When we do the analysis around um, the cost of child maltreatment, and in the U.S., people say the lifetime cost of child maltreatment, $124 billion, right? That's the big analysis. The CDC has it on their website, all that stuff. But the thing that I really enjoyed looking at it, I was like, huh, that doesn't seem to make a lick of sense to me. I bet you that that analysis does not include the, heart, the cost of treating ischemic heart disease, right? Because in the U.S. alone, we spend how many trillion dollars? Almost three, almost three trillion dollars a year on healthcare. Seventy-five percent of it is for treating chronic disease. And if you have an A score of four or more, you have double or more the risk for seven out of ten of the leading causes of death in the U.S. So our team actually did the analysis. We pulled this uh, for California, and I can't tell you what the number is because. Uh, we still have to publish it. We just there, there, we have two papers on this that are that are um, being reviewed, being peer reviewed right now. But I'm going to tell you the number is uh, multiple orders of magnitude bigger than the previous estimate, right? Because when people looked at the effect of child maltreatment, all they looked at before was the broken bone right, or the head injury and the medical cost of treating that, or the long-term cost of mental health or behavior problems. Nobody was calculating the cost of cancer. Nobody was calculating the cost of heart disease or chronic lung disease or liver disease. And those are the biggest drivers of healthcare costs in the U.S. and, in fact, globally. So when we talk about the impacts of childhood adversity, and particularly we think about what does the public not know? If you all will notice, actually one of the things that has been really amazing is that with the current crisis of children on the border separated from their parents, all of a sudden toxic stress is in the news. It's really sad that the reason toxic stress is suddenly front page news is because the U.S. government it has implemented a policy that is essentially giving children toxic stress. That's a really sad statement. But what I will have to say the heroes of this conversation, right, of this story, are it's really the media. The media who raised this issue and the media who did this really strong reporting to say, hey, by the way, what are the impacts on these children the policy of the U.S. government is dramatically increasing these children's lifelong risk of not only mental health, behavioral, learning, and developmental problems, but also of asthma, diabetes, infection, pneumonia, heart disease, stroke, cancer, etc. And that piece um, has been really powerful. And one of the big um, one of the things that, if there's, if there's one thing that I can communicate to you all, is that there are so many parts of the story that are currently either not being told or not being told well, right? So, for example, if um, I, uh, when we look at, if someone is a business writer or a financial reporter, right, the economic impacts of childhood adversity are nuts. Great example. I was, um, I, I gave a talk uh, somewhere, and uh, at this talk, one of the sponsors for the talk uh, was the CEO of a large, uh, multinational, many billion dollar publicly traded company. And after my talk, this person reached out to me and um, 
And of course, I'm a nonprofit leader. So when he asked for a meeting with me, I said yes in a heartbeat, right? And, um, and you want to know what he wants to ask me? He asked me if I would join his board. Why? Because his company is a very, very large company that employs a lot of low-skilled workers. And his biggest, one of his biggest problems is a workforce issue. His workers are getting injured on the job. They have issues with substance dependence. They have um, issues with, uh, you name it, depression, drinking, domestic violence, uh, all kinds of health problems. And after he heard me speak, he said, wow, we really need your expertise to try and put together a workforce program to, to help our workers. Because when you realize that two-thirds of the population has experienced adverse childhood experiences, and that um, work for injuries on the job, workforce injuries, disability claims, all of those things are directly related to ACE scores, Right? Again, there's another angle that no one has talked about. Similarly, when we think about um, uh, issues, for example, we're, you know, we're seeing it right now with the migrant crisis in terms of policy, international policy. We're seeing it a um, uh, couple years ago, I was invited to Jamaica to speak about adverse childhood experiences. And there are um, more and more countries that are taking on adverse childhood experiences as uh, a major issue and leading, uh, leading national campaigns. Um, in 27, oh, I guess it was. It was last year. I um, had the opportunity to go to Montenegro uh, for a big Know Your ACES campaign. Uh, but when I went to Jamaica, I did this, you know, big Know Your Aces campaign. I was on Smile Jamaica. I was, you know, gave lectures at universities and, and uh, met with uh, members of the Minister of Health and the Minister of Education. And um, it was the, when I spoke to, um, it was the U.S. State Department, the U.S. Ambassador, who actually paid my honorarium to come down and speak in Jamaica. And when I asked, like, you know, hey, so why did you do this? Like, why were you interested in doing this? Um, what he said was, it's a security issue, right? So how do you think you recruit kids into gangs and militias, right? You take kids who have been maltreated, right? Who, if, I mean, we see this globally. Folks are, this is a recipe, right? Like if, if you, this is when you look at child soldiers, right? What do you do? You take them away from their parent, which is their buffering caregiving system. You abuse them, you maltreat them. So what does that do? It activates their, um, th their stress response. It, it, it makes the part of the brain that are responsible for, for uh, you know, uh, vigilance and fight or flight response turns it way overactive, inhibits the prefrontal cortex, which you would need for impulse control and judgment and all that good stuff, right? And then you put a gun in their hand and tell them to go kill that person, right? So it was fascinating to see that our State Department um, saw reducing adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress as an important tool to reduce um, the, uh, security issues, right? Global security issues in countries like Jamaica. And, um, and those are the stories that are not being told, right? Because when we look at uh, this issue of adverse childhood experiences, and I didn't speak specifically about, um, I should clarify, you know, what do we mean by toxic stress? The one other thing that I think that the media was up until very recently getting really wrong and then suddenly now is getting it right, which is amazing. Even in this, in the last three weeks in the news cycle, at the beginning of this migrant immigrant crisis, right, uh, this refugee crisis in the U.S., folks were saying the toxic stress of uh, being separated from your parent. Um, and the interesting thing is that toxic stress refers to the biological stress response, right? 
the overactivity of our fight or flight response, right? Our a, you know, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and our sympathoadrenal medullary axis that make cortisol and adrenaline respectively, right? And, and these changes to stress hormone to these long-term increased risk of health and, um, and behavioral problems. And the reason, so, so toxic stress refers to the stress response, not to the stressor. And an interesting thing about that is children can be exposed to a certain amount of stress, right? This is not a thing where you're like, oh, okay, well, adversity is bad for kids, so you can't ever expose kids to any adversity. But our mechanism, our biological mechanism for buffering that stress and the definition of the toxic stress response is overactivity of the stress response in absence of the buffering caregiving system that would regulate that stress response. And this is why the US policy of separating children from their parents at the border, particularly when they're fleeing adversity, is so damaging. Because it does a double whammy. You take kids who are already stressed, you give them extra stress by taking away their parent and caregiver, and then you eliminate the, the buffering system that, that the, would be necessary for their bodies to protect themselves from long-lasting harm. And the reason that's so important and the reason it's critical that um, the reporting on this changed over the course of the weeks of the migrant crisis is that if you think that uh, toxic stress is a stressor, right, then it's very easy to say, oh, well, you know what? What are you saying? We need to remove those kids from all adversity? Or if you want to blame someone for the stress in these kids' lives, blame their parents. Or if you want to blame for so someone for the stress in these kids' lives, blame the people who brought them here because that was a terrible, harrowing journey, right? But the issue is, no, no, it's, yes, you want to reduce the dose of adversity that children are exposed to, but it's not just the stressor. It's the combination of high doses of adversity and we, the US government then remove their buffering system. So we are responsible for their dramatically increased risk of long-term health neurological uh, problems. Um, I know I'm probably almost out of time, so I am going to, uh, I'm going to, the one other thing um, that I would also add is that everyone talks about the impact of childhood adversity and toxic stress on brain development, right? And the, 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 as if somehow, right, what happens above the neck and what happens below the neck are completely separate. And one of the things that I think is really um, important and powerful as a part of this conversation is that the effects of childhood adversity are definitely on the brain, but it doesn't stop at the neck, right? When, we, when I talk about toxic stress, I talk about neuroendocrine immune and genetic regulatory disturbances. And there's also cardiovascular, but it depends on where you put that, right? Um, but the reason that's important is because when we talk about the long-term effects of childhood adversity, um, folks always, uh, they talk about it as if the only effects are behavioral, right? So I, I show a slide of the kids in my practice who had, who experienced four or more adverse childhood experiences, and I show, you know, this really strong dose-response relationship between learning and behavior problems. For, for our kids who had zero adverse childhood experiences, 3% of them had learning and behavior problems. For those who had four more adverse childhood experiences, 51.2% of them had learning and behavior problems. And you know the question that people always ask me? Oh. 51.2%. Well, what about the 48.8%? Why were they resilient? That question drives me nuts, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> I was at a conference talking to a woman, and she said, oh my goodness, Dr. Burke Harris, I love your work. It's so fantastic. I have a friend you need to talk to. She herself grew up with lots of adversity, but she overcame, and she, uh, you know, got her education, she had a wonderful marriage, she got a great job, she's doing all of this wonderful work, giving back, you need to reach out to her. And I said, she sounds very interesting, I would love to 
you know, talk to her if I have time. And uh, she said, okay, here's her email, and I'm not making this up, but don't reach out to her now because she just had a massive heart attack and she's still in the ICU. I'm not making this up. And I'm like, I don't know that Sister Girl was resilient, right? And the reason that this is so important, right, is because when a celebrity dies of an overdose, people say, oh, you know, his, his, his childhood adversity, his dad was a drug addict, his mom abandoned him, he was beaten, right? And he had an overdose or he was depressed or he committed suicide, we make the link to childhood adversity. But when someone dies of a heart attack or a stroke or gets autoimmune disease or gets cancer, no one says, ah, of course, their childhood adversity. And if we don't make those connections, we're never gonna get our share of that $2.9 trillion that the US has spent it every year on chronic disease, right? We are never going to get the investment into the solutions to prevent this problem as long as we continue to tell the incomplete story that the only outcomes related to childhood adversity are related to uh, you know, mental health or behavioral outcomes. So I'll pause there and open up for questions. Should I sit over there or should I stay here? Where I'll stay here, I'm more comfortable here, okay. okay. Wherever you must come from. So uh, as you'll read in the book, and you talk about uh, changes that can be made in medical practices in schools, and I was wondering if you might give an idea of where there's been significant uptake and what that might look like in terms of getting, you know, getting the information about whether a child has had adversity and what to do from there. Yeah, so one of the interesting things about doing this, uh, doing this work um, was that the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, when I first read it, uh, A, I was shocked that I had never heard about it before because it had been published 10 years before I, um, before I came across it and I literally just stumbled across it. And, and BT dubs, like I did my master's in public health at Harvard, I did my residency training at Stanford, I, I wasn't at like University of Podunk whatever, like these are places where you would assume that you would get cutting, cutting edge training, right? And I never learned about it. And so when I, when I read it, I was like, everyone needs to know about this. And one of the things that we've literally seen in the past, um, you know, five to six years is that number one, the American Academy of Pediatrics has taken this up as an issue. They had the first ever national conference on toxic stress in 2015. Um, the Our Center, the Center for Youth Wellness, worked on trying to figure out how do we use this information to screen efficiently and effectively, right? And so instead of, and it, and it was this process of trial and error, it took us probably about eight years to develop a screening protocol that could be done as part of you know, the typical well exam for a child in three minutes or less. And the way that we did that are, are I think, a lot of this people think that you need to have some crazy medical technology or, you know, and a lot of it is simply process innovation, just tweaking the process a little bit, uh, bit by bit to make it easier to do. Um, and so what we did was we de-identified the ACE questions. So we, in our questionnaire, which is at the back of your book in Appendix 2, instead of asking um, families which of these adverse childhood experiences has your, has your child experienced, right? We ask them, don't tell us which ones. Only tell us how many. And we did that for two reasons. One, because that number of how many, and this is actually a really important issue, the reason that we use the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study is because you have these huge data sets to say if someone has four or more adverse childhood experiences, they have double the risk of asthma or 2.2 times the risk of heart disease and 2.4 times the risk of stroke, et cetera. So you need to have reference data, right? Or else no one will know whether or not you're moving the needle on this public health 
issue or not, right? So, and that's why the 10 questions are actually really important. Because if you took, if you ask a different 10 questions, it now changes your relative risk, right? Like you can't, you can no longer say someone's at double the risk for heart disease. You say, I think they're at increased risk of heart disease, but I don't know how much. And so that's why having this, uh, having the ACE questionnaire, because we have this huge body of reference data is so important. Um, and so we took that and made this into this de-identified screen. We were working with that for several years and then we now created something called the National Pediatric Practice Community on ACE Screening. And we made our tool available online for download for free. And, um, and anyone can sign up to be part of our practice community. Any primary care uh, physician or, or clinician can sign up to be part of our practice community. And in the last three years, our, country, our um, tool has been downloaded more than 2,400 times in, God, I think it's like 28 different countries. So that's been really exciting to see the uptake and the use of the screening tool. And just as a follow-up, um, is there a country or region where you're seeing the most interest? And then we'll open it up to everybody else. Um, I have to say that uh, there are a couple of places. Uh, Australia and New Zealand, they, they've invited me to come down and speak like I don't know how many times. <laughs> but unfortunately, it's a really long flight and I have four kids, so it's a, a really long time to be away from the, uh, the office. But if anyone from Australia or New Zealand, keep inviting me because I'm going to come one day. Um, Australia and New Zealand, um, I was very impressed by what I saw in Montenegro. Literally, I mean, it's a small country, but literally, I, I, I sat down with the president of Montenegro, like the president, the parliament, the Montenegrin Medical Society, the, you know, medical students, the, you know, so, so their, their commitment to launching an initiative about adverse childhood experiences um, was, was very impressive. And I, and I will say I'm headed to Scotland in September, and Scotland has made a commitment to be the first trauma-informed nation. So we'll see. I'll let you know how Scotland goes. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm working on a story right now about the pediatric community and screening for ACEs, and I'm wondering if you can address um, some of the um, challenges that a lot of pediatricians, at least they've brought up to me, um, that A, they're so limited at t you know for time, so how in the world can you add in one more thing to screen for? And, the f and sort of another angle to that is, yeah, so they, they screen for it, but they don't know what to do after they get the information. So I'm sure you've seen that. Yes. So that's why we created the National Pediatric Practice Community on ACE Screening, is to help uh, clinicians learn how to respond to this issue, learn together and faster, and learn from each other's experiences. Now there are a couple of um, inherent assumptions in those questions. And I will tell you, um, people think like, how can you ask these questions because don't patients resent it or don't, don't they feel like it's invasive? And I'm telling you, it's not the patients who have a problem with the screening, it's the doctors, it's the, it's the clinicians. But one of the pieces that's inherent to that question is a, um, a point of view that for a pediatrician, when you screen, that the purpose of screening is to identify a social problem that you can then refer to someone else like a social worker or a mental health uh, provider. And one of the things that we're doing to specifically debunk um, uh, that issue or help to solve that problem is um, something that I've been doing in my own medical practice, which is helping clinicians understand how their job is different when they know the ACE score. And I'm just gonna give a quick example. So um, ADHD, that was the biggest thing that I was seeing, right? Attention deficit. Uh, what's the number one treatment in America for ADHD? Stimulants, Ritalin, Stratera, Adderall, right? And if you look, and this is why the science is so important because people really think, when they hear about ACEs and toxic stress, they almost think of it as like a, like a, like a social 
problem or a social science issue. But when you look at the curve of the function of the prefrontal cortex relative to stress hormones, it's an inverted U. So if you have too little stress hormones, you don't, your, your prefrontal cortex doesn't function normally. So that's why Ritalin and stimulants are the number one treatment. You give stimulants and you go up on the curve and you improve functioning. But the problem is, what if your prefrontal cortex isn't functioning because you have way too much in the way of stress hormones? Then adding a stimulant is not going to help and it may even do harm. And in that case, you actually, the treatment is to reduce the dose of adversity, enhance the buffering for the child, and in that case, when we do use medication, we use a non-stimulant medication called guanfacine as a first line, and that is a, a blood pressure lowering medication that was originally developed um, that they were giving to, to like vets, and they found that it also dramatically helped their PTSD symptoms, right? And when they looked at why it worked, it's because it helped to regulate uh, part of the fight or flight response. And so when we give this uh, medication as a first line, what we find is that far more often we see improved functioning in addition to our multidisciplinary care. So the idea that the difference, that a doctor has a difference in the type of prescription medication that they're going to prescribe based on whether a child has the identical symptoms but an ACE score of zero versus an ACE score of six makes it more important for doctors to do the screening. They're, not, they're no longer screening so that someone else can do their job, and probably it's kind of a pain in the behind. I've got to find a therapist or a social worker, which I don't have in my clinic anyways, right? It's like, there's a way you can help this child get better today with the resources that you have right in front of you, which is your pen and your prescription pad. And there's also the other thing that I'm doing that I think is really important is even, for example, there's evidence to show that individuals who have high ACEs, um, they not only are at greater risk of developing opioid dependence, right, but they also have, um, uh, there, was a, there was a paper in hospital medicine that shows when you're doing conscious sedation, when you're putting a patient under, the higher their ACE score, the higher the dose of medication that it takes to get them to go under. Right? So this is, for doctors who think that this is like nice to know stuff for other social workers to do, this, this literally is, this changes the way we practice medicine. And this is where the field of toxic stress is so critical because there's an incredible amount of research to be done because an overactive stress response changes the way every single organ system functions. So if you are a doctor and you want to treat those organ systems, you better know how to do that in the context of an overactive stress response. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, so I'm a British child psychiatrist and our first line treatment for ADHD is parent training. Um, you wouldn't get Ritalin if you hadn't been through parent training, which perhaps fits with what you're saying because you want to increase the protective system. I just threw that in because that's not my question, but I, I was so pleased with what you were saying because it helped me justify to my parents now why I want them to help reduce their child's stress. But I'm one of the things that concerns me, and this isn't in Britain, this is in the Caribbean where I'm working now, where we have very, very high rates of physical or punitive uh, punishment, is that neither doctors nor parents nor teachers regard that as an adverse experience. And I've been for the last few, I'm interested in early child development, but I've come to the conclusion that training on physical chastisement is really important because when I interview parents, they make a big distinction between child abuse, which is what other parents do, and lashing, the word they use, mm -hmm. the child, which is necessary to bring them up well. And I wondered if you had done research, s I know you say you don't ask about the adverse experiences, but specifically on the effects of physical punishment, because I think we're not addressing that issue, and I think it's having a major effect. Um, so when I was in Jamaica and I was talking about this issue and ACEs and know your ACEs, um, one of the biggest things that I came uh, up against was uh, this lashing concept and, uh, and being Jamaican, I know all about it because in my first grade in Jamaica, the principal had a belt, every teacher had a belt, and that's how you keep, it's a good part of, you know, it's raising children, it's keeping them in line. 
And um, there are lots of cultural reasons why that practice evolved, but understanding, a, a being able to share some of the science of what happens in a child's brain and body when they are experiencing that lashing, right? And um, so you can, you can get a child to have, to be compliant with a lashing, right? knowing that it is also going to put them at increased risk for long-term harm, or you can get a child to be compliant with other tools that don't involve beating, beating them into, you know, or not, you know, because it's not perceived as beating, but um, that, that don't involve that same uh, type of, uh, that type of discipline is specifically targeted at activating the stress response, right? To, you know, so that, so that the child uh, becomes compliant. And interestingly, we may talk about lashings in, in, in countries like, uh, like uh, regions like the West Indies, but I will tell you, in, in developed nations where there's, there's a lot of child abuse, even, you know, lashings are now out of vogue. People don't uh, beat kids as much as they used to in developed nations. But you know what we still do a lot of? Psychological abuse. And that's another myth that I want to make sure that I get out there, is uh, in chapter 10 of my book, I talk about a Silicon Valley executive, right, who has this in, who is experiencing uh, verbal and psychological abuse in her own home, and then starts to see symptoms of what she didn't know was toxic stress in her own children. And I think it's really critical for for everyone to understand that this happens in all communities, in all income levels, and psychological abuse is similarly targeted at activating that stress response. It's supposed to terrorize, terrorize and terrify you, and that's supposed to, to that, that's the way of getting compliance, right? And understanding um, that it's the same fundamental biological mechanism. This is what we're seeing with the administration right now. We're like, they're like, oh, well, we didn't hurt the kids, right? We didn't beat the kids, so it must be okay. And it's like, actually, and this is why the ACES framework is so powerful, because each of those 10 things, they may seem different on the outside, but what they activate in our bodies is the same final common pathway. And that is why the effect size is so high between the association between adverse childhood experiences and negative health outcomes, because all of them activate this fight or flight response and then that leads to this long-term damage. Yeah. <coughs> uh, my question is about your visit to Montenegro. Yesterday, the United Nations released its uh, annual report on children and armed conflicts. The General Secretary, Antonio Guterres, held uh, a press conference yesterday in New York. Uh, the report uh, has, uh, the, reports, uh, the report says that more than 21,000 children rights violations uh, were reported during 2017 and 10,000 children were killed uh, or maimed during this period. Some of the figures are that uh, some, of, uh, some of the children were uh, detained, some of the children were uh, recruited as soldiers, and some of the children uh, uh, were uh, also in, in, in the juvenile de detention, they were put there, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, South Sudan, Nigeria, these are a few of the countries where children face such kind of uh, situations. My question is, one is the early childhood adversity that you discussed in Montenegro. The ongoing crisis, how much the ongoing crisi uh, crisis contribute uh, to the security or to the uh, conflicts uh, in such countries uh, uh, on teenagers, uh, basically, mm -hmm. not only on early childhood uh, adversity? Yeah, oh, so, so specifically, what is the impact of these exposures on teenagers? Yeah, the ongoing conflicts, how much do they contribute? Yeah. Not the parental or the uh, other behaviors that uh, children have been during their early childhood. Yes, so, um, so there's a couple things that we know. I don't know that I, uh, that I know the answer to your exact question, but there are a couple things that we do know. 
we do know that the, um, the earlier the exposure, um, the greater the risk of harm. Uh, we also know that um, high doses of uh, adverse or traumatic experiences, even in adolescence, can also lead to increased risk of harm. And adolescence is, um, is also a time of unique vulnerability because, so, so when we talk about air times of vulnerability, um, one of the things we talk a lot about is about neuroplasticity, right? And um, the younger you are, the more neuroplasticity you have, right? So if you're itty bitty, you have, you have lots and lots of it. Um, and then uh, one of the, there are additional windows of expanded neuroplasticity around adolescence and pregnancy and parenting. And the reason, and this is why I tell people don't stop at the neck, right, is that hormones, sex hormones like testosterone and estrogen, um, they act on the brain to enhance neuroplasticity because our, our teenage years and our pregnancy and parenting years are times when we're trying to figure out the world and there's a t it, there are times of incredible learning. And so our bodies actually um, have, a, have a system by which we can, we, we can learn uh, um, our, imp our experiences can imprint on us, right, at, a, at an accelerated rate during these times, which is adolescence and pregnancy and parenting. So that is a, another time of high risk. In terms of the specific risks, um, in ter health risks, um, to adolescents who are exposed to, uh, for example, conflict or war, I don't know the answer to that question. But it's a, I, we know that there is some risk, yeah. Hi, sorry, um, thanks so much. That was absolutely fascinating. I think you heard loads of jaws dropping uh, throughout your talk. And um, what I was wondering was um, on, on, a, on a higher level in terms of um, policy making, when you're at a, at, at a table with the president of Montenegro or you're speaking to um, people that are in charge of, of these things. Obviously, the American example of, of splitting um, families is a very direct example of government impacting um, trauma in kids. But what are the avenues that you see, and it's quite a general question, but what are the avenues that you see that you can recommend policymakers to start to deal with these issues? Because it's such getting from that position to a, to a tiny child in a, in a, in a house um, b being abused. H how can you even begin to, to try and make that yeah. work in policy? So there are a couple of things um, that I think are big takeaways for policymakers. Um, number one is that uh, one big question that folks ask me is, oh, well, how do you do this intervention with a child or protect a child or prevent problems with a child if most likely the parent is the one who's doing the harm, right? Like how do you, how do you get, or how do you even ask the questions in your clinic? And one of the things I, it's important to me that policymakers understand is that adverse childhood experiences tend to be handed down from generation to generation to generation. So when I see a child who has high ACEs, almost universally, their parent or caregiver, th their parent also has high ACEs. And what that means from a policy standpoint is the investment we make now pays dividends for the next generations, right? Because everyone has seen the situation where the kids got high aces, you look at their mom, their mom's got high aces, their dad's got high aces, their grandma's got high aces, right? And you're like, really? How much, uh, how much more are we going to, uh, how much longer are we gonna let this go without intervening, right? The second piece of it is also understanding the full scope of the cost, which I think is, uh, why it's so important, and I'm excited about our, our um, report that's going to be released later on this year. But the other aspect of it is the other myth that's out there is that there's no treatment for this, right? Or there's, there's no, there aren't any in effective interventions. And there, there are a lot of things that are demonstrated to improve outcomes, right? Home visiting programs, mental health access, um, parenting leave policies, right? Um, in addition to the healthcare delivery system, 
this integrated primary care behavioral health, uh, which is something that we, we focus on a lot here in the US. Uh, we're not doing it very well or a broad scale, but um, it, it's, it's very important. And the other thing that all of the science shows us is early intervention improves outcomes, right? So we have to do, in order to do early intervention, that means we have to do broad scale screening, right? So I, I and my organization are on a mission to ensure that every child in the U.S., we're focused in the U.S., is screened for adverse childhood experiences by 2028. We've set a date on it, right? So universal screening, early detection, early intervention with the things that we know work in terms of integrated uh, medical care and behavioral health care, uh, home visiting, uh, parental supports, and, um, and in addition, there's some other things that I talk about um, in the book in terms of recommendations around sleep and exercise and nutrition and, and mindfulness and, and um, uh, mental health and healthy relationships. But supporting, supporting these healthy relationships and, and recognizing that buffering capacity of nurturing caregiving to uh, inter interrupt this toxic stress process all of these pieces should be informing our policies mm -hmm. on a global level. Thank you, Dr. Burke Harris, for your spe for your uh, talk. It was really wonderful. Um, just uh, just kind of uh, elaborating or expanding on Jack's question. Um, you speak about the buffering. Um, the, the, the buffering that parenting interventions or the potential that the buffering that buffering programs like that have. Now in South Africa we've got um, various uh, evidence-based interventions. Um, we have positive parenting programs and we've got um, something called dialogic book sharing where parents uh, read to their children, which has shown over the past five years, because they only started it in 2013, that there has been a reduction in gang-related violence in various provinces in South Africa. My question, however, is, and I just wanted to ask you if you've had experience of this or if you know of any other evidence-based interventions that might look at a more... Um, so, so in South Africa, uh, a lot of the intergenerational trauma, there is so much intergenerational trauma, but many people have said that they would prefer to have a non-Western uh, non -Western interventions. Mm -hmm. So that would mean um, sort of ancestral connections, ancestral healing. I don't know if that has come um, up for you and how one can implement that sort of thing. So I think one of the biggest challenges uh, with these uh, with uh, non-Western uh, interventions is that at one of the the big obstacle that we have to overcome is that people think this is a bunch of touchy feely in your head mumbo jumbo, right? And one of the one of the important pieces of this work has been demonstrating and clo closing the gap right, uh, between exposure to childhood adversity and these long-term health outcomes. So we do that lots of different ways. We look at population-based data, we look at molecular data, we look at clinical data, and that, that's my, because where there's a gap, people introduce their doubts and judgments and myth and misinformation. So as much as possible, my, a lot of my uh, work has been focused on uh, bringing together all of these different sources of data to make this watertight case around uh, all of the different mechanisms. Now the challenge that we have is that uh, we also have to do that in a way that stands up to scientific rigor, right? So um, that's one of my favorite things about doing the science is when people try to um, uh, uh, pick my methodology is apart, right? And it's like, it's rock solid. I love it, it's my favorite thing. <laughs> and, um, and so the, the challenge with a lot of these ancestral healing practices is that um, um, in order to say, okay, we have the standard of evidence, for many folks, that's a, that's a randomized control trial. If you look at where most of the data comes from, US, UK, Australia. Right? Why? Those are the places that have the money to do randomized control trials. They're expensive. I'm doing one right now. It's incredibly expensive. And so folks can do, um, when, when these 
when communities put into place these ancestral healing practices, right, then what ends up happening is they get it written off as anecdotal because you don't have the rigor of evidence and it's not published in a peer-reviewed journal. And so what I think we have opportunities to do um, is, is look at those practices as promising practices and then figure out how do we evaluate them or understand what are the core or essential aspects of that and, and how do we evaluate them uh, in some rigorous methodology. For example, you know, the, the, the one exception to that is mindfulness, right, where there are randomized controlled trials that look at mindfulness and they don't just look at, and this is the other important thing, the outcomes that they're evaluating against are not just behavior or criminality or or substance use or um, uh, you know mood or something like that. They look at you know in the book I talk about studies that look at randomized control trials using mindfulness or meditation versus heart disease, cardiac functioning, you know echocardiograms, uh, uh, EEGs, electroencephalograms. Right, to be able to demonstrate in a language that people will take seriously that these interventions improve health in a way that we're accustomed to measuring them. So one more question, I'm gonna give it to John Walker Krauss. Hi, uh, thank you so much, first of all, for the work that you do, it's uh, just enormously important. I, I've spent the past year and a half or so writing about uh, the impact of gun violence on uh, children. And you know, I know that in some communities in this country, uh, there's been uh, that threat for decades that kids have grown up with that threat walking to school or walking anywhere, just leaving their home, even in their home. What I've noticed just in the past couple of years is um, an intense sort of paranoia, especially among younger kids at schools. Um, even though it's extremely unlikely that there could be gun violence at their schools, there are you know kids um, writing wills and you know uh, there's intense fear when they go through these active shooter drills and. It's just on their minds in a way that I, I don't think it certainly was in years past. And I wondered it, how you think that could affect this generation of children who are uh, just dealing with that fear in a way that they haven't in, uh, in decades past. Yeah, it's an interesting, uh, so I think, that, I think that there is likely to be an effect, although, um, I, I think it may be difficult for us to measure the effect size, and, and part of the reason for that has to do with the fact that um, when something like gun violence happens, and it happens broadly across the um, population, if, they, if the child has a, that safe, stable, and nurturing caregiver, so the gun, the exposure to gun violence and the multiple triggers of seeing on the news and reading in the newspaper that that same gun violence is now happening all over the place. So you have these repeated triggers. Um, um, that's going to activate the stress response. But the effect that that will have on the child is um, differential based on the capacity of their caregiver to regulate that response, right? So. This is a, another example of an environmental exposure that has differential impacts uh, depending on, so for example, particularly low income communities or communities where there are um, high levels of other stressors. Let's say the parent um, struggles to be that buffer simply because they're working two and a half jobs. Right? And they can't be there when the kid's sitting in front of the TV and getting activated and getting stressed and is having trouble sleeping at night and doing all, all those other things, right? Or that they themselves uh, are dealing with high levels of stress because of they're trying to put food on the table and um, you, you, they have all, they're, they're also living in an unsafe neighborhood. And so the parent of the, themselves has a very high activated stress response. And uh, when a parent or caregiver has a very overactive stress response, it becomes very hard to help them to, to for them to help their child regulate the child's stress response. And so we see um, uh, in those cases what the data shows, particularly looking at community violence, is that if you look at the impact of community violence on heart disease, for example, 
you may not, you don't see that same strength of the relationship, but when you look at the impact of cumulative adversity in vulnerable communities, what you see is an outsized impact on those communities that already have that exposure. All right, so um, earlier, Dr. Burke Harris informed me that in order to prevent toxic stress responses in her and her four children, she has to make a flight. Decision.